Greetings, Ape Scholars. It is three days before the exam. That means it's that time of year. It's time to get ready for the Apes 2022 exam. Uh, hopefully you like the new uh, format we have here brought to you by StreamYard. Not a promotion, just a shout out to a great streaming service. If you ever want to stream something, check them out. Uh, so good to see some familiar faces in the chat. Marco Learning, great AP test prep resources. You guys check them out if you don't already. They are awesome. Kyra is our moderator tonight, so make sure to thank her. She is a ape scholar of the highest order. She took the exam last year. She got a five. She knows her stuff. Uh, she will answer your questions, and she may put you in timeout if you're uh, being a little too spammy in the chat, although we have slow mode on, so it should be uh, limited to 60 seconds between questions, uh, and so that should help us out there. And also we have a couple other familiar faces, uh, Natalie or Natalia, sorry, shout out to Natalia. She has been a committed, dedicated ape scholar all year. She's been leaving comments on tons of videos and it's great to see her here reviewing with us. Same thing with, uh, Aditya. I hope I said your name, right? I want to give some shout outs to, again, some of the super dedicated watchers and commenters uh, for the channel. So it's great to see you guys here. Uh, so what we're going to do today uh, is review units one through five. Uh, there's nine, there's nine units on the exam and we want to try to cover one through five. So what we're going to do is lay out some important resources that I think you can use because you can't, study everything you need to know in just these two hours of live streams, of course. So what are the other resources that you need to follow up with? So we're going to start out by going through resources. I'll try to keep an eye on the chat, try to pin some questions if they're great questions. Uh, there will be unit six through nine tomorrow night, same time, seven to 8 PM. I know there's confusion with the time I listed it from eight to nine on accident. I meant to list it from seven to eight. I, I got to go to bed early, you guys. I'm, I'm getting old. I'm almost 30. And so I need, I need my eight hours of sleep. Uh, and so I moved them up a little bit. But we can go a little bit late tonight. We can go to, you know, 8.15, 8.30 for some questions. Same thing with tomorrow night. So we'll we'll shoot for more 7 to 8.30. Uh, and so as we have a few more folks uh, streaming in, welcome. If you're just joining us, we are going to review units one through five. We're also going to talk about resources you can use. So how can you study smarter rather than harder? What's the most effective use of your time coming down the home stretch here? Uh, so without further ado, let's um, pin the link tree to the top if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, we'll pin Kyra's message to the top of the chat. So if you have questions, pretty much anything that's covered in here will be covered or linked in the link tree. I also get a lot of requests for shout outs to classes. It's hard to stay on top of them all this year. Uh, but Ben, shout out to Ben and his science classes. Uh, wherever you are, whoever your teacher is, whoever your fellow scholars are, I'm glad that you find the resources helpful. It's so much fun to create them and it's so much fun to see people uh, that benefit them. So thank you. And John or whoever's manning the Marco Learning uh, channel tonight, thank you for understanding the constraints that I operate under. It's hard to stay up late for an old geezer like me. All right, so uh, enough about our agenda for the evening and enough uh, mushy gushy apes talk. I do love this community, but let's get into it. Let's do some review. So what we're going to do first before we go any further is I wanna point out some important resources that I don't think ape students always realize they have access to. These are the behind the scenes. I say behind the scenes as if they're secret. They're not a secret. I just don't think people utilize them enough. So these are the all the released exam questions from the past. So if we just drop these in uh, the chat, then you can uh, check those out. But you can also just Google, you know, Oh, sorry. Now I'm <laughs> now I'm guy sending you into an endless mirror screen there. 
Um, so we'll just stay on the screen here and you can Google apes FRQs if you want to follow along here. But what I want to show you is one of the most important things to do before you take this exam on May 3rd. I want you to check out the release 2021 exams. Now there's two sets of them and these are the best guess. I say guess because I don't write the exam and you're never going to know exactly what's on the exam. But these are the best guess that anyone has, including AP environmental science teachers, as to what's going to be on this year's FRQ section. And this year's FRQ section, as any FRQ section uh, is weighted, is worth 40% of the exam, almost half the exam. So you really have to go through here and you have to write one of these if you have not yet. This is the most important thing to do. So you've got to do this if you haven't done it. Uh, you can go here. You don't need your teacher to assign it to you. Maybe they did already. Maybe it looks familiar, but go through and put on a 70 minute timer, answer these questions and then score your own work. You can go uh, back to the keys here. And what's amazing about this is that not only can you score your work, but you can see sample responses. Again, this is so, so underrated. Alexis says, we did this set in class. Alexis, uh, shout out to your teacher. You clearly have an experienced teacher who knows their stuff. They are giving you some of the best review they can. So let's check this out here. I don't wanna, you know, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't written these, we don't wanna spoil the answers, but let's go all the way down to the bottom so you can see what I think is so neat. Another kind of behind the scenes thing, when I have a student in class who uh, debates the way I've scored their question, or they're like, you know, Mr. Smeets, I feel like I earned this point. The scoring guide says this. Why did you not earn this point? You go down to the very bottom and you can see the actual narrative from the person who graded this question. You can see an overview, like what were the big kind of picture takeaways? And then you can go and you can look at why did score 1A or sample 1A earn a nine? And you can see exactly which points they missed. Uh, same thing with score five, same thing with, with uh, the one that scored a two. So you can see, you can see how you did. Uh, so let's talk though about multiple choice because multiple choice is 60% of the exam. We just looked at FRQs, that's 40% of the exam. They're really important. You can definitely increase your grade a lot by doing that. But what are some other things that you can do? Uh, you can do multiple choice practice. Uh, so there are unfortunately no freely available, like you can't just go pull a multiple choice uh, test out of thin air online. Maybe if you dig around, you might be able to find one that was posted legally, but you can't generally find one other than the 1999 practice, which I would not use. You're going to have questions like, uh, you know, which city in India featured a release of mercury that blinded, you know, 79 people over like just mad specific questions that are not going to be on this year's exam. Uh, and so where can you get full length practice exams? Your teacher can give you full length multiple choice practice exams in class. Uh, and you can do those. They have to be in class, though, unfortunately, like they're supposed to be either you're sitting there in class taking on paper or they've assigned it to you during your class period remotely with uh, a computer. And so it's kind of hard uh, to do those. You can also, of course, there's review books and um, there's other uh, review materials where you can get these. But I want to point this out here for a second, because we had this question, are there any good multiple choice question review resources? This, this is exactly what I want to show you guys. If you want to check out something that is going to be one of the fastest ways to review all nine units, but also get two full length practice exams, you can check out the ultimate review packet. So this is something that I worked on, something that two really experienced AP environmental science teachers worked on, and they created two full length practice exams. So I'm giving you kind of look behind the scenes here. You can go check out unit one uh, totally for free. See if it's something you think you're interested in. We have a lot of people here who have tried this. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, cube file has tried this, or maybe he's just made it through all the videos. Um, but lots of folks in here have tried uh, the ultimate review packet and I think have found it really helpful. So I think it's something worth checking out. And especially if you're looking for practice exams. So if you go down and you, you buy this packet and you actually get access, you're going to get 
a full length practice exam for uh, both FRQ multiple choice with an answer key. And then you're going to get a second one. So if you go and look at this exam, this is written by people who write the actual exam for the college board. So the two apes teachers who, who wrote these practice exams uh, that helped me work on this packet, they know the question writing process inside and out because they actually write for the exam. So if you look through this test, it's going to look very different from the released 1999 test from the college board because there's been a course redesign. It's not going to look the same. Uh, and so you can check this out. And if you go through here, it's going to be uh, really, really helpful because again, it was written by people who write for the college board. So this is like top notch uh, teachers who know more about the test than I do even. They wrote this and they find it uh, to be really strongly aligned to the practice exams and everything else. So check it out. I think it's really helpful. Uh, and I would love to hear from more people who find it helpful, who've checked it out. Uh, and so what we'll do here is go on and check out a couple more uh, resources that you should use. The course and exam description is also a really important resource. So now we're kind of getting more to resources and then we will get into actual content review here shortly. But I want to make sure you have some more resources to check out. So this is underrated. Again, I think sometimes you guys don't know by you guys, I mean, ape scholars, like we don't as teachers tell you enough to just go right to the source. So this is from the college board. This is what I call the apes playbook. This is how I know uh, what to do, what to study. Uh, and so I go here and I look through this. And it helps me know, you know, what is the breakdown of the exam? What should I tell my students to be studying? And so if you open this uh, document and it's, you can just Google APES uh, CED, and then you can click through here and you can see again, the breakdown of the course. So you can uh, scroll down to the table of contents section. Sorry, I think we're having a little bit of uh, spotty Wi-Fi issues. Hopefully it's still uh, running for everybody. Uh, but what I wanted to do here with the APES uh, CD, show you guys that you can find the info straight from the College Board. So you can look at science practices and see exactly how they're worded, exactly what the types of questions will be. And you can even see the exam breakdown. So if we get into... Uh, the table of contents here, if I can scroll up a little bit. These are all hyperlinks. So you can click on exam over, actually go down and see exactly how the exam is broken down. So if we go down to exam overview, we can remind ourselves again, like what's the multiple choice breakdown? What's the FRQ breakdown? But here is the pro tip that I think is so, so helpful. You can look at the exam waiting. And so you can remind yourself, what should I be studying? How can I study smarter, not harder? How can I study the stuff that's especially weighted on the exam? So unit one and two, you'll notice in our review that we're about to do, we're going to go fairly quickly through units one and two. They're only six to 8% of the exam. Uh, and then for units three through six, we're going to go a little bit more slowly. That's 10 to 15% of the exam. We'll speed up a little bit tomorrow night when we review eight and nine, because they're only seven to 10% of the exam. And we will will take a long time tomorrow night to go through unit nine. It's 20% of the exam. It's 20% 20, 20 of the exam. So that's too important uh, not to not to review. Um, so I know I know the connection is a little unstable, um, but thanks for thanks for bearing with us here. Um, we'll see if we can get the the router moved a little closer to the apes versus everybody HQ for tomorrow night's stream. We'll work on the internet connection. But let's get into some actual content here so that we can review uh, what we need to from, from a content standpoint. So these slides are not going to look uh, new to you guys. You'll have seen these before. But again, what we're going to try to do is blaze through as much of we, as we can. And I'm going to stop on what I think are the really critical topics to review. So I actually want to skip right past the ecosystem basics here. 
And I want to go a little bit deeper, even past the biomes. And for unit one, I really want to focus on the carbon cycle. So let's go a little bit further here so we can get to the carbon cycle and do some carbon cycle review. So these are just super, super important aspects of unit one to understand. So as we transition now into unit one, remember six to 8% of the exam. So we're going to go kind of quick. We're going to cover what I think are some of the most important parts. So with the carbon cycle, you have to remember that you have sinks, sources, and reservoirs, okay? So in a sink, you're taking increasing amounts of matter. And so you're sinking essentially that matter down into the ground, like into fossil fuels. And so with the carbon cycle, you're sinking carbon into fossil fuels, into marine sediments that get compressed into limestone. They're going to be stored there for millions and millions of years. Now, what's a carbon source? A carbon source is going to add carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere, add carbon in the form of methane to the atmosphere. And so that's really important to understand as well. And so why do we care about, about this? Why does it matter? Well, if we add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we incre increase the rate of climate change. That is the big takeaway here from the carbon cycle. Another thing to remember, though, with the carbon cycle is that we have photosynthesis and cellular respiration. They're roughly balanced, meaning that plants are taking out about as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as animals and plants and all living things are respiring back into the atmosphere. So it's roughly balanced. It's a pretty quick cycle through the biosphere into the atmosphere, biosphere into the atmosphere with, with carbon dioxide. Uh, and so if we look a little bit deeper, another thing we should remember, though, is that CO2 can dissolve out of the atmosphere into the ocean. And that's going to be used by organisms in the ocean for photosynthesis, but it can also, unfortunately, lead to ocean acidification. So it can make the pH of the ocean lower. It can dissolve the shells of marine organisms. That's a problem that relates to Unit 9. We'll be talking about that tomorrow. Um, we can just move that header uh, just hide that there. So we're not covering up our screen. So hopefully that helps. Um, and as we transition though, into some other topics in unit one, this is a topic that gives a lot of people some grief, the nitrogen cycle. So in the nitrogen cycle, we have a ton of different forms of nitrogen, but what you should focus on is nitrogen fixation. Be sure you really understand nitrogen fixation and be sure that you remember that nitrogen in the atmosphere floating around as, as N2 gas molecules, it's not usable. It's not usable by plants. It needs to be fixed. I think of the nitrogen atmosphere and you know, nitrogen gas molecules bouncing around the atmosphere. It needs to be grabbed and fixed, solidified into the soil as ammonia or ammonium that can be absorbed into plants roots or assimilated so if there's nothing else to remember about the nitrogen cycle it's nitrogen fixation and remember that's the process of taking n2 gas and fixing it physically locking it away in soil as ammonia or something else that can be used by plants i've seen a couple questions in the chat about the replay so the replay will be up pretty much as soon as we're done here i'll hop into youtube studio just make sure it looks good and then post it so it will be available for you to check out. Now, the thing I want to point out is how nitrogen is fixed. Nitrogen can be fixed in a bunch of ways, but in nature, one of the primary ways nitrogen is fixed is by bacteria. Uh, and so these can either be freely living soil bacteria or bacteria that live in the root nodules of plants. And they're going to take that nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere and they're going to fix it as ammonia. Now, that's really critical for plants they can't use that nitrogen that's in the atmosphere, that N2 gas. Some of those bacteria live in the root nodules of legumes. A legume is a plant like, you know, bees, bees, those are animals, <laughs> beans and peas and peanuts. And so if we jump all the way ahead to unit five really quickly, some of you re may remember that you can do crop rotation where you're putting in, you know, soybeans or peas or some other legume in between a nitrogen demanding crop like corn. And that's going to actually replenish the nitrogen levels of your soil. And so that can be a pro tip to kind of think of a solution, an environmental solution in unit five to, you know, loss of nutrients in soil. 
put some leguminous plants in the soil, they can return nitrogen to the soil. It's also a reason you want a nice biodiverse soil because the more biodiverse it is, the more decomposers to cycle nutrients. And then, you know, the more bacteria that you have breaking them down, returning the nitrogen, you know, from dead animals and plants to the soil, from fixing it from the atmosphere to the soil. Now let's go though to the big T here uh, in the chat who's asked a question. Extreme heat, whether it's lightning or burning fossil fuels, bacteria nodules on legumes fixate nitrogen or fix nitrogen. in fossil fuel combustion. And so nitrogen can be fixed synthetically, meaning by humans when we burn fossil fuels, and that's gonna form nitrate. That's gonna emit CO2 into the atmosphere though. And so that's one way that you can have some global kind of climate change impacts of, of fertilizer use. Um, so good question there. Um, let's see, if we go on to other topics in unit, one that I think are the toughest or the trickiest. We're going to jump ahead a little bit to um, NPP and GPP. These are topics that are a little bit challenging to understand. So I think it's I think it's worth reviewing. And as we review this, I want to do a paycheck analogy. So think about if you have a job, the thing that you're wondering at that job when it comes to the money that you make is what am I paid per hour? It's per unit of time, right? They don't say you're going to make $79 at this job. They say you're going to make $10 an hour per employee. And that's the same thing with NPP or primary productivity. It's the rate of photosynthesis or the rate of energy production in a given area for a given period of time. So there's kind of three components to it. There's three components to it. But what you have to do is you have to subtract from the gross primary productivity, the total amount of energy produced, you have to subtract what the plant uses. And that is respiration loss. And in this analogy, that's taxes. So think of if you get a paycheck, you get this gross paycheck, but you have to give some of that away to the federal government, to the state government for taxes, and you get to keep the rest. That's your net paycheck. And so the plant, gets to put into its plant tissues net primary productivity. So grapes, you know, it could create fruit, seeds, leaves, roots, stuff like that. And that is going to be net primary productivity. So the equation is NPP, net primary productivity, is just equal to GPP minus respiration loss. The total amount of energy minus respiration loss. Would this be a calculation question like on an FRQ? Great question. It's really hard to say. We haven't typically seen what I call niche math topics like NPP on an FRQ. Never say never though. You don't know. It's hard to say what will be on this year's exam. What I can tell you, uh, B, is that I made a math review video uh, that you can check out. It's in my link tree. Um, or if it's not in the link tree, it's one of the top videos on my channel. You can go check it out. And it's going to be uh, something that goes through the most likely type of math to see to the uh, more complex math. Sub-zero and Nayesh, good questions here. Are calculators allowed? Calculators are allowed, are allowed and they actually don't have to be um, super basic. You'd be surprised if you look at the testing instructions, which calculators you can use. Double check with your teachers, um, but I'm going to actually do... Yeah, graphing calculators and scientific calculators are allowed. And I'm going to give you kind of a pro tip here. You don't have to clear, uh, you don't have to clear the RAM going in, or I don't know what it's called. It's not called RAM. You don't have to, you don't have to clear everything out. Um, and so I'm going to actually do a video on TikTok as we get closer to the exam, kind of giving you tips on how can you set up your calculator to help you out uh, and make sure you know how to do the math problems. Um, if you want to know how to do the math problems, just watch the math review video. But um, you can use calculators and you can use scientific and graphing calculators. And I'll talk about what I mean by, by formulas and programming and everything on a future video. But I want to stick to review content here. So if we look here, we can see that there's trends in productivity. This is kind of the big picture, big picture idea when it comes to 
is trends in productivity. So when you have a really highly biodiverse ecosystem, typically that biodiversity stems from the high primary productivity. Uh, and so if we look here at swamps and marshes, tropical rainforests, they are going to be highly productive because of temperature and precipitation patterns. It can be very warm, so a long growing season, and lots of rainfall, ample water to support plant growth. Now that plant growth supports biodiversity. So let's build again some big kind of topics, tie everything together here. We look at the tropical rainforest and we think, oh, it's lush and green and it's biodiverse because it's a tropical rainforest. But really, if we actually jump all the way back here to topic 1.2, this is really important. So I want to go over it. The reason that the tropical rainforest looks like a tropical rainforest is where it is on Earth. I know it's a weird thing to think about, but the reason that it is where it is on Earth, or the reason that it has the uh, tropical precipitation and temperature patterns is because it's closest to the equator. And so it receives the most rainfall because the sunlight is hitting most directly at the equator, causing air to rise. And as air rises, that moisture in it uh, is going to fall as precipitation because it's going to get further from Earth's atmosphere, or Earth's surface, is going to get colder. Cold air can't hold as much moisture. And so you're going to have some rain. I'm seeing a couple comments, questions in the chat. I think we can. I, I don't know how to move it, but we can just turn it off so the logo doesn't get in the way. Um, thanks again for all the feedback on our first run through here of the new uh, format. In terms of knowing the biomes, I wouldn't memorize a bunch of facts about them, but this diagram right here is going to be helpful. Um, yes, this is great, Kyra. You know, you don't need to know you know, you don't need to know 10 animals from every biome, but you should have a basic idea of where the boreal forest biome is distributed. And you should have a rough, rough idea of temperature and precipitation in each biome. What I mean by that is essentially, is it really warm, really rainy? Is it really dry, really cold? Is it temperate? Meaning that it has four kind of distinct seasons where you're going to have a warmer uh, rainier growing season and a, and a cooler, drier winter season where there's not growth. Those are the things. Don't memorize biome rainfalls in millimeters or animals. Know where they are on the map. Know their basic relative temperature and precipitation. Uh, all of these slides, by the way, I've seen a couple questions in the chat. All of these slides are available in my link tree. If you scroll down, link tree should be pinned uh, to a comment. Kyra can also drop it in. And these slides are all open access. You can go in there and have a look through them and find anything we're reviewing. So let's get on to unit two, though, because we do need to cover more than just unit one. Uh, so unit two, hands down, I th think at least the most important topic in unit two is biodiversity. Biodiversity is going to come up again and again and again on exams. You know it's going to be somewhere on every APES exam, many places probably. So let's review the three levels because so many times on FRQs, students write high biodiversity or they just write, you know, an ecosystem is going to be strong because of its biodiversity. But let's go a little bit deeper. There's ecosystem diversity which is the number of different habitats. So if we look at that picture on the top here, you know, we have kind of an alpine ecosystem or like coniferous, like uh, forest ecosystem. We have open ocean, we have intertidal zone. It looks like there's even maybe like a dry desert on the far right of that little picture. And so you can see that we have a wide diversity of habitats. That's what ecosystem diversity means. Species diversity, that's species number or species richness. So how many different species are present in an area? Although there's another measure of species diversity that we're gonna talk about in a second. And then you go down to the basic level of the organism and that's genetic diversity is where populations are gonna have lots of different members with lots of different traits. And that genetic diversity at the population level helps populations be resistant to change. Species diversity helps ecosystems be resilient to change. Let's go through what I mean by that. Before we do, though, really quickly, 
uh, species richness is one way to measure species biodiversity, but evenness is important as well. So if we take a look at these two uh, communities, we have one on the left that's perfectly even, meaning 25%, uh, you know, e or each tree species is 25% of the forest. On the right, community two, though, is kind of dominated by that one species. And so it's not going to be nearly as uh, biodiverse because it has a lower species evenness. So their richness can be the same, but community one is going to be more biodiverse because it has greater evenness. Let's take a look at why genetic diversity matters. This right here may be one of the most important slides in unit two. So many students know that biodiversity is important, but so few students can articulate at a high level, why is it important? So let's try to make you one of those students. If we look at this potato example, if you have a diverse crop of potatoes, meaning a bunch of different uh, genetic traits, or even subspecies of potato, and a blight or a disease strikes, you're going to lose some. You So you see in this diagram, you're losing two potatoes, but you have so many other potato species or so many other genetic variations in the existing population that the population survives through that disturbance. And they reproduce and they pass the resistance onto their offspring. That last fact there is key. So if an organism has a genetic adaptation that lets it survive, it passes that on to its offspring. Now the whole population can receive this trait and you can have protection from, you know, mass disruption or mass extinction. When we look at cloned potatoes, these could be GMOs. So now we'll look ahead to unit five again, genetically modified potatoes that are all identical. A blight hits, they're all susceptible. The whole population is gone. So the same thing goes for a population of wild squirrels. If there's a population of wild squirrels with a lot of genetic diversity, now you're going to have a greater likelihood that they survive a drought because maybe some of those squirrels have high drought tolerance. They're really able to store water, conserve water, live on less water, and the population is going to persist. So that's why genetic diversity is important. Um, so if we look ahead in unit two, another really important topic in unit two is ecosystem services. This is going to come up in some way, shape or form. They may not call it an ecosystem service, but they'll say, what's a benefit of blank? And I'm going to actually show you an example in a second. Ah, super cat. I think we have an AP bio scholar here. You do not need to know the law of independent assortment. You do not need to go down to a deep degree of nuance when it comes to crossing over or, you know, sister chromatids or kind of the genetics or even the kind of population level, you know, reasoning behind genetic diversity. Um, so good question. If you've taken AP bio, it doesn't hurt to know that, but you don't need to go that deep. Let's take a look at this question, though. Do we need to know about the difference between genetic species and ecosystem diversity? I would say it's not going to be asked. You're not going to be asked, like, which one is this? But on an FRQ, if you can reference that you're specifically talking about genetic diversity, it's going to increase the quality of your answer. So good question. Now, ecosystem services are huge. Ecosystem services are huge. Why are they so important? Because we all know that nature matters. We all know their trees are important. <laughs> but why? Why do they have such tremendous benefits specifically to humans? We know they have a ton of ecological benefits. But what are the ecosystem services that they provide? If you see the word ecosystem service, you should be thinking money. Things that humans do for us, sorry, things that nature does for humans, for us, that has financial benefit. So provisioning services are the most straightforward. These are just goods, things that come directly from nature. Wood, paper, if you hunt animals or if you gather plants to eat or sell as a product, it's a provisioning service. 
Regulating, they provide a stable climate. They can filter air, trees can, uh, and that gives us less healthcare costs due to emphysema or asthma. They can absorb floodwaters. Absorbing floodwaters is an underrated ecosystem service. It's something that we don't think about a lot, but when it rains really hard, and we've seen this in Houston, if anybody here is from Houston or from Texas, uh, we've seen it in parts of Florida when there's really heavy rains from a hurricane. But Houston flooded really badly uh, during past hurricanes, but also just heavy rainstorms because there's so much impermeable surface and they don't have a lot of intact wetlands. They don't have a lot of intact forest ecosystems in the city or nearby. So there's nowhere for that water to go. So let me show you what I meant by this can come up on um, exams. If we look at the... FRQ. So we're going to switch here in a second to looking at this current FRQ set. What we're going to see is that there was an environmental uh, problem or an environmental solution, I should say, that was centered around absorbing excess flood water. So we're going to pop ahead here uh, to, a, to a question so I can kind of show you how would ecosystem services come up. Um, so if we change over here to this FRQ, and we take a look here. So we have this town that's considering selling this uh, undeveloped parcel of land and they have 30% wetland, 70% pasture. Now the wetland runs right through the middle of the property and they wanna build homes. But if you take out that wetland, you run the risk now of there being flooding in the area. And so, you know, you wanna propose a solution to protect the frog species, but also still develop the properties. A parcel of land just means like a, you know, like a space, a, a block of land. Um, and then what's a salute, what's a, uh, a potential advantage of the plan other than protecting frogs? So let's go to the answer key for a second. Again, spoiler alert, if you're planning to write FRQ set number two and you don't want to see the answer, you know, look away. <laughs> But we're going to go through and look at the scoring guidelines here so I can point out a few pro tips when it comes to environmental um, design, or I'm sorry, proposing solutions to environmental problems. Let's see here. So if we go down, it says propose a viable solution that will result in protection of the endemic frog species. So here are some ways that you can build that housing settlement but without destroying the frog population. You could build up, not out. So project developers could say, we're going to build X number of housing units, but we're going to stack them high so that they don't take up as much total space. Or we're going to designate the wetland as a park or nature preserve. Here's one of the big pro tips. Instead of just saying, don't develop the wetland, make it a park or a wildlife preserve so that it can't be developed. If you make it a wildlife preserve, that protects it from development or just restrict the development. Say you can't build within 20 feet. That's pretty small. 200 feet, you know, half mile or something um, of a wetland. And that could help protect the wetland. Let's go down and look at an additional solution. So in addition to protecting the frogs, if you designate it as a park, the preserved wetland area will help prevent flooding. So this is kind of how I'm tying in unit two ecosystem services to what we talked about with this uh, preservation of wetlands, providing basically a giant sponge to soak up excess stormwater. Uh, so a couple of questions here that I think are important just to take a look at from kind of a study standpoint. Daniel says, why are there two 2021 sets while the previous years only had one? There were numerous administrations of the exam last year due to some schools still being uh, hybrid, some schools being remote, some schools taking it at home digitally. There's just a ton of, ton of things going on. So they've released two sets last year. Every other year has one. But if we go back here, again, I said this at the beginning of the stream, but I'm going to say it again. This is the single best place to get FRQ review resources. Because if you look through here, uh, 2020 are only in AP Classroom. Your teacher can assign you those. 
We have 2019, four questions, 2018, four questions, 2017, four questions. So you have so many questions here to draw from. You have sample responses, you have scoring guidelines, and even the chief reader report. So you have all of this kind of like, you know, insider baseball or like look behind the curtain at how you can understand this stuff. Also, it's happening so fast that I don't have time to, you know, call it out or recognize it, but shout out to all the people in the chat who are like answering each other's questions. This is what I love about doing these live streams is you guys answer your own questions. I can't stop and answer all of them, obviously. And so, you know, it's just so nice to see. Let's go back here for a second. Question about the FRQ we we're just looking at. So I think what they're implying, again, if we go to the guidelines here, the fact Lord says, how would how would restricting development uh, or designating as a park allow for property development? So if you designate just the wetland as a park, you can still develop around it. So if we go down here by saying develop or by saying protect a portion of the wetland, what they're doing is I think is they're kind of implying you're still going to develop around the periphery of the wetland. And if we go back to the question, um, it was a parcel of land that was like 70% field or, you know, prairie or something and 30% wetland. So you're just protecting the wetland part. Um, but it's a good question. All right. So one other thing I want to point out here, this is another great question. Um, Rohan says on the multiple choice, I get like 85%, but on the FRQs, I'm so lost. So that's awesome. That's going to give you a really big buffer. But then what you want to do is you want to write some of these Rohan, you want to go through here and write as many of these and practice scoring them as you can. The other thing you want to do is you want to go to my channel and there's three videos that will walk you through the ins and outs of maximizing your points on the FRQ section. So if you do that, it should really help you out because I think a lot of people are in your boat where they do really well on multiple choice, but the thing that could hold them back from a five is writing really efficient FRQs. And so Kyra has just linked in the FRQ review videos. Uh, so let's see if we can pin those. And then that will be at the top as well. Um, and that can be something that people take a look at. So I just pinned uh, Kyra's recommended uh, review resource there, which is going to show you basically the ins and outs of how to maximize your score on the FRQ section. I don't want to take too much time to descend kind of down into FRQs because I have so many videos that go through FRQs and I'm going to leave some Q&A time at the end. So I'm going to go back into two and three and really we wanted to get through two through five uh, or one through five in this in this review session. So let's get back on track uh, and then we'll try to do like a Q&A at the end. So we'll go to maybe like 815 and then we'll do more of like a Q&A where I can just stop um, presenting and just focus on on questions because I do want to answer questions. I think it's really helpful. Um, so let's see here. We're going to switch back to slides and we're going to go on from. Uh, unit two, we'll, we'll cover one last thing in unit two that I think um, is really important. Again, it's an underrated, underrated thing that people don't fully understand, which is adaptation. So shout out to my AP bio scholars in here. I know some of you are here, um, but let's take a quick look through here. So fitness and adaptation, what does it mean to be fit in an ecosystem? What does it mean to have an adaptation? An adaptation is just a trait, a genetic mutation that makes you more likely to survive and reproduce. Survive and reproduce. How does that work? So natural selection is the mechanism here. So if we look at these field mice, we have brown field mice and gray field mice. Brown field mice are gonna stick out like a sore thumb in this dark, rocky ecosystem. Maybe we should call them rock mice. So the selective pressure, the selective force is the eagle here, whatever this bird of prey is. And it's going to be swooping over and eating the tan mice. 
they're going to die. And over time, you're going to have more gray mice and the gray mice are going to be selected for that grayness, their gray fur is an adaptation because they survive and reproduce at a higher rate than the brown mice because they blend in. Let's give a shout out to uh, the Garden of English. Always good to see uh, Tim Freitas here. Tim is the master of AP Lang, probably AP Lit too, probably anything related to English. Uh, check out his channel later if you're taking AP Lit or, or AP Lang, I should say. Although, like I said, it's he's an awesome English teacher, and so he probably has stuff for Lit too. But Lang is definitely a specialty of his. So check that out. Um, Garden of English, awesome fellow teacher YouTuber. Always good to see them in the comments. Uh, yes, and another another thing I want to point out, uh, there is so much math review that's posted already. So that's why I'm not doing a lot of it now. We can go through some at the end, but I'm not doing a lot of math review now because there's so much of it out there. There's a lot of other teachers that have math review videos, but I made one that goes through exactly what you need. Uh, it's on my channel. It's one of the top videos there. So just go check that out and it will definitely help you. All right. So we had a little, uh, you know, guest cameo. We've had Marco Learning come through, Garden of English, and always happy to be distracted to say hello to a fellow teacher YouTuber. We are going to hop into unit three, though. So let's keep it moving here with populations. And with populations, we're going to go pretty fast because some of the early stuff is pretty simple. Um, but we have some more tough stuff to cover towards the end. So 3.1, specialists and generalists really straightforward. If you're a specialist species, you need a specific food resource and you're less adaptable because of that. A panda is not going to be as likely to adapt to a new ecosystem. It needs bamboo. A raccoon, very similar species, is going to have a huge niche. Niche kind of refers to, it's actually somewhat of an outdated term in ecology, but you can still use it in apes. A broad ecological niche means that you can use a lot of different food resources make use of a lot of different habitats, and you'll be just fine. And so a generalist is more likely to become invasive for that reason. So they're more likely to come into your ecosystem and just dominate by eating all sorts of different animals, disrupting the food web, and breeding really rapidly and having a lot of their offspring uh, survive. So let's actually do one more link tree pin so that we keep that there because I think that is going to be the most useful thing to have pinned. So the link tree is pinned now. If you ever see a resource here and you're like, where is this? Go check the link tree. Um, so let's move on now to R and K selected species, sometimes called R and K selected strategists. Don't get confused if they say strategist. It's the same thing. So K selected are quality over quantity. K selected parents, I like to tell my students K for care. They take care of their children. They stay there and protect them. These are things like mammals and birds. That means that if we jump ahead to survivorship really quickly, we're going to see type one survivorship curves. So K selected species like a whale, their offspring are going to survive at a really high level and they're not going to start dying off or dropping off in survivorship until the end of their life. Yes, K care are rushed. It's a great way to do it. I tell my students uh, R for run away. An R selected parent runs away afterwards, like a spider or a fish swim away. They don't stick around. Um, here's the thing though. Both work. Both strategies work, but you just have to understand why they're different. So a type three survivorship curve, like a flower, fish, spider, most insects that I'm aware of. I don't know of insects that care for their offspring. They're probably out there, but who knows? They are going to just let their offspring go. And that's why their offspring have this huge drop off. You can see there on the, uh, oh, this way, that way. <laughs> you can see on the survivorship scale, just have a huge decrease in survivorship early in life. Uh, and so yes, K for care, R equals rushed. And so that our selectedness also, though, makes those species more likely to be invasive. So if we go back up to um, our selected, look at the zebra mussel. 
zebra mussel is going to lay thousands of eggs per year, and it's going to outcompete other mussels. And we can see that in this diagram here. This is a great example of what an invasive does. They lay so many eggs. They have so many offspring that they outcompete the unionoid mussels or the other mussels. And that is going to be because of their R selectedness. They're likely also generalist species who can eat anything in the water as opposed to having a more specific diet. So let us move on to some population dynamic stuff. We're going to look at carrying capacity, which is really important too. So carrying capacity is this idea that there's limited resources in an ecosystem. And so a species can't continue reproducing forever. So early on in a population, you can see they're going to have exponential growth. They're going to be shooting up in their population size, flying, growing really rapidly, but they're going to level off as they reach carrying capacity because they have limited food, limited water, limited shelter. And in theory, they reach this perfect level and just stay there. But that's theoretical. That doesn't really happen. What really happens in the wild is overshoot and die off, overshoot and die off. And we can see that in this graph here. What happens is animals like deer are going to reproduce in the fall and then they're going to have their offspring in the spring and they don't know how many the ecosystem can support. So they have a lot of offspring and then a lot of them don't make it. That's why there's the overshoot. There's more uh, fawns. Or can I, there we go. There's more fawns born in the spring than the ecosystem has space to support. And there's a die off or a die back. Then they're below the carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is here. So they shoot back up over the carrying capacity and then back down. So it just continues on like this. All right. Love the camaraderie going on in the chat. Didn't know we had freshmen and sophomores in apes. It's awesome though. You love to see it. Let's pin another question from Daniel though. This is a great one. Are all invasive species are selected? Good question. In general, yes, but you never can dwell in the extremes or deal in the extremes in science, especially environmental science. So it's a pattern. That's not to say a mammal could not be invasive. In fact, rabbits have been invasive in some ecosystems. Uh, they eat huge amounts of the plant biomass and prevent it from being eaten by other organisms in that ecosystem. And a rabbit is, is generally a more case-selected strategy. So it's not an ironclad rule of thumb, but it's definitely a trend worth noting, Daniel. But good question. Um, let's go on here to human population dynamics. So really important thing to understand is the population pyramid, age structure diagrams. Now, students who have an okay understanding of apes know the basic shapes. Students that have a really good understanding of apes and are going to do for, really well on the exam, earn fours and fives, they understand age cohorts and why shapes of a population pyramid tell you what's happening in the future. So let's go through that. In the blue, we have pre-reproductive age cohorts, zero to 14. These are people who are not yet reproducing. Then we have in yellow, 15 to 44. They are reproducing. And then in brown, or I guess it's more of like a rusty kind of orange, we have post-reproductive age. They're above 45. They're not having children. So the reason that a population is currently expanding and will expand in the future if it has a really wide base is that means you have tons of individuals in the population who are children who are not yet reproducing. And they will reproduce more in the future when they become the reproductive age. So it tells you, one, population is growing really fast right now because we have a really high birth rate. But two, we're going to continue growing in the future because think of this population pyramid as moving up. So each couple years, you're going to take the current bar, if we look at this very lowest bar here, and like shift it up. It's going to keep moving up. So you have to remember that. Um, the graphs are not always in color. And so you do have to know the basic cohorts, 0 to 14, 
15 to 44, 45 plus. Do you need to memorize population numbers for the exam? Yes, kind of. Um, and then one other good, just quick kind of housekeeping thing. Uh, we're just going to keep it rolling. I moved the time up to seven. Um, so if you're here at eight and you're like, what the heck? I thought it started at eight. We're, we're going to keep going. Uh, so we'll, we'll push it past eight and probably go to eight 30 or so. Uh, so yeah, they may show different shades of gray on the exam. You may just have to know and look at that and kind of draw the lines yourself. Um, so keep that in mind that you may need to figure that out. Zero to 14, 15 to 44, 45 plus. So what does it mean if a population has kind of a pyramid, but not super, super dramatic like this, you know, Guatemala, Nigeria, or Saudi Arabia on the far left? That means the country's still growing, but it's growing slightly. You're not having way more children than the parents' generation had. Parents are having, you know, like in the ballpark of two to three children because they're just replacing themselves and not a lot more. Then you get into stable country. They have basically no growth. Their pyramid is more like a tower because you have parents in yellow who are having almost the same exact number of kids in blue as just what's needed to replace them. And so let's transition now really quickly into uh, replacement level fertility and talk about that. So TFR is going to be total fertility rate, but let's talk about factors that increase it and decrease it as well as the kind of replacement level fertility I just talked about. So total fertility rate is the average number of children a woman's going to have in her lifetime. The higher it is, the more rapidly a population is growing. So if we jump back here uh, for a minute and we look at this country in the top left, they're going to have the highest TFR. They're going to have the most children being born because they have the widest base of their pyramid. So if we hop back down to TFR and factors that influence it, then we have this idea of replacement level fertility. So this is the population size that's needed to just maintain your population. So if parents have about 2.1 children in a developed country where most children survive, that's going to be a replacement level. That's going to keep a country's population pyramid like Spain, Portugal, or Greece that we see here. So these countries, we would expect Portugal, Spain, Greece, they probably have a TFR around two because parents are just replacing themselves with their children. In Guatemala and Nigeria and Saudi Arabia, based on this age structure diagram, we're going to guess their TFR is much higher, six to seven maybe. Mothers may be having you know, six or seven children on average, and that's why you have such a wide base of the pyramid and why you have such rapid population growth. Let's also transition this now into the demographic theory of transition because you guys are kind of jumping the gun in the comments and we have questions about it. So let's go all the way down and see if we can find the demographic theory of transition. Here we go. So in 3.9, this is where we tie everything from three together. Uh, and so let's, let's do a quick review. First, we have this idea of industrialization because you may see the terms like pre-industrialized and industrialized too. Industrialization refers to economic and social transition. So instead of a farming agrarian economy, you have more of like a mechanized factory-based or service-based economy. So in a less developed nation, which we typically call phase one or phase two, you're going to have more families working in agricultural fields. They're growing their own food. They're selling a little bit of food. And so they have a lot more children for a couple of reasons. One being that they have less access to contraceptives and less access to education, less access to healthcare opportunities that could decrease the number of children they have. Two, they need support for the family labor. It's having more children in an agrarian economy means that you have more food to produce because there's more people to help grow food. It's also just a cultural and societal and sometimes religious factor at play. So sometimes large families are looked at in different cultures or different religions as a blessing and a wonderful thing. And why would you not want to have six or seven children? 
And so it's not so cut and dry as saying there's one factor that leads to less developed nations or phase one or phase two countries having really high birth rate. It's all of these factors coming together, culture, religion, economics. And so make sure you understand that there's a variety of reasons at play. Um, we're going to skip past all of these little kind of micro nuances of each stage and just do a big picture review of all four stages together. So uh, if we look at stage one, we don't really have many stage one countries in the U.S. They're almost all phase two, even our, our you know, really developing countries or our least developed countries are mostly into phase two. So what happens in phase one is birth rate and death rate are both so high. So many children are being born. So many people are dying due to lack of access to health care that we have very little population growth. The births offset the deaths. Then we get into phase two. That's where population growth explodes. Birth rate stays high for cultural, religious, and economic reasons. It takes people a long time to adjust to having fewer children. Generations, 30 to 40 years or more. So birth rate stays high, but death rate comes down. And since growth is the difference between birth rate and death rate, a big drop in death rate means a big growth rate. So look at phase two and try to think through that for a second. Birth rate stays high. Death rate declines due to greater access to clean water, health care. And so population growth skyrockets. We get into phase three. It's still growing, but that growth is slowing down. And that's because birth rate now begins to drop and come closer to death rate. As birth rate comes, so we have death rate down here in a phase three. As birth rate declines, you're slowing growth because you're decreasing the distance between birth rate and death rate. So again, let's think through that one more time. Phase one, birth rate and death rate are both high. Phase two, that death rate comes down and that means population growth because there's a big difference between Number of people born, number of people dying. In phase three, we have birth rates starting to come down. We're decreasing that distance between them. In stage four, birth rate and death rate are both very low. They're almost equal and there's very little growth. And you also have then what their populations look like here. Now, here is an important math tip. You may have to calculate the percent growth rate of a country. If you do, Let's go take a look at the formula that you need. Um, it's going to be somewhere right around here. So if a country has a CBR of 18 and a CDR of 9, how do you calculate that? Well, all you do is you subtract the crude death rate from the crude birth rate, 18 minus 9. Again, it's just the difference. Crude birth rate, 18. Crude death rate, nine. The difference between those is nine. And then you divide nine by 10 because you're going to divide by 10 to get into a percent because crude means per 1,000. So let me go back here for a second. This is um, the doubling time rule of 70. And then we also have CBR minus CDR over 10 as the way to calculate growth rate. Let's go a quick uh, sidebar here to answer some questions. We do not get a formula sheet, but what you can do is store these in your calculators program for the exam. So this is something that teachers have pointed out. There are savvy teachers who read the full terms and conditions on AP central and they look at what calculators you can use and they look at the rules and you don't have to clear the memory on your calculator and you can use a graphing calculator what i'll do is i'll make a little video um i'll put it on tiktok or put it on youtube and clarify because what i want to do is i want to show you that this is i want to show you like the terms and conditions that say exactly what you can do so that you understand why you can do that and I'll also show you how to do it if you're having questions about that. But yes, you can store these uh, so that you don't have to commit them to memory. But they're not super complicated, so it doesn't hurt to know them. Because you may waste some time, you know, dinking around in your calculator trying to find things. 
So let's just talk about the why. Crude means out of a thousand, but you need to divide by 10 to get it into a percent. And so that's why you're going to divide by 10 at the end. Rule of 70 is this fun little apes quirk that you do have to know, but it's really easy to remember. It's just 70 divided by the percent growth rate. And that's going to equal the doubling time in years. And so you're going to divide 70 by 1.2, which is a growth rate that we just you know made up. If you have 1.2% growth, that means it's going to have 58.3 years to double. And we didn't make it up. Actually, it's the global population. I just forgot where that 1.2% came from. Uh, and so that would be how you do that. What we're going to do now is go into unit four. But let's just put this up here really quickly. IPAT formula is theoretical. Impact equals population times affluence times technology. You don't need to know IPAT, but it doesn't hurt to have the basic idea down. What it means is the environmental impact that a, that a country has is equal to population, how many people it has, affluence, how rich they are, how much money they have, how much they consume, oil, gas, clothes, electricity, bricks, building materials for their house, and then times technology, which could make it actually more efficient and reduce the impact. But you don't need to know IPAT per se. Um, another good question, is there a list with all the formulas we need to know? No, but there's a YouTube video I made that goes through all the formulas you need to know. And the basic formulas you need to know are the CBR formula we just went through, the growth rate formula we just went through, and percent change. You do have to know those. I guess if you call NPP a formula, then you should know that NPP equals GPP minus RL, but I, I don't know if I'd call it a formula. Um, so let's move on here. to unit four. And in unit four, we have a lot of topics, but one of the most important, one of my favorites, very near and dear to my heart is soil. So let's talk about soil for a second. Soil is more than just this stuff on the ground. And it is a complex mixture of a bunch of things. So it's sand, silt, and clay, and it's nutrients, and it's water, and it's even microorganisms. So don't forget that soil is lots of different things. It's this complex mixture. And finally, just one more kind of pro tip here, because I'm not covering a lot of math in tonight's video. I'm really trying to stick to content. Um, shout out to Javier, or ha Javi, if I'm pronouncing your name right, who tried the math in the ultimate review packet, found it really helpful. It's going to take you through every type of problem you need. You can pause it in live time. You can ask questions in the comments. I reply to most comments. I try to really make sure I'm responding to those and helping you out. So check out the ultimate review packet. You can check out the video for free on YouTube and see the practice questions. It's just the answer key and some of the other stuff is in the review packet. So check it out uh, and it should be helpful to you. <clears throat> uh, sushi. I strive for that level of YouTube excellence. I, th I think I have a long way to go, but I take that as a strong compliment. And actually the editor of the Heimler History Channel uh, is a really talented editor. He worked on the Ultimate Review Packet. So if you look at the Ultimate Review Packet and you're like, man, these videos are crisp. Like this is really popping. This is uh, you know crisp and it's coming together and, and the edits are strong. It's the same editor as the Heimler History Channel. So, uh, yeah, shout out to Steve Heimler. He is a gold standard of teacher YouTube. And shout out to his editor, Taylor, who worked on the Ultimate Review Packet. Uh, it's been super fun to work with him and just kind of, you know, get a look into that world of, of awesome editing. So let's get back to soil, though. Don't want to get too distracted. Soil is this complex mixture of all these different things. What are some things we need to know about soil though? Well, we should know the difference between weathering and erosion. Weathering is the breakdown of rock into physically smaller pieces by wind, rain, even roots of, of plants. 
Erosion is its movement, its transport somewhere else. And so those are two different things. Weathering is breakdown. Erosion is transport somewhere else. Now, erosion we think of as bad. And it kind of is. If you have erosion on your agricultural fields, you're losing topsoil, you're losing nutrients, organic matter. Your fields aren't going to be as productive. But that soil that is eroded, it goes somewhere. And that somewhere is probably into a body of water eventually where it's going to become sediment. We call soil that's gone into water sediment. It gets carried away and deposited into a wetland somewhere else or deposited into an estuary. And then that ecosystem is really productive. So erosion has really negative connotations when it comes to agriculture. But we should remember, it's just the objective movement of soil. So erosion in a, in a geological sense, it's not bad. It's just soil moving from one place to another. But if you're a farmer, soil erosion is uh, death to your bottom line. You lose nutrients. You lose decomposers and bacteria in the soil that fix nitrogen. And so that is just really, really important that you retain. So let's talk a little more about properties of soil because not all soil is the same. If we look at properties of soil, it's really important that you know the basic way that we classify soil is texture, the percent of sand, silt, and clay. So you got to have this down. Sandier soils are going to have more pore space, larger pores. And that's going to mean water can more easily enter. They're going to be more permeable. They're going to let that water infiltrate and seep down through that sandy soil. Clay dominated soils, on the other hand, are going to pack really tightly together and they're not going to let much water through. And so they're going to really retain their water. And in fact, they can retain it so well that plants can drown if that water pools up. Good question. Are larger pores better or worse? Hard to say. Some plants like sandy soils. They can snake their roots really easily through that big empty space. Water moves through it. But if your pores are too small, if you have only clay, you can't really get any water deep down into the layers of the soil where you might have your roots. And so what is best It's hard to say what's best, but if we have a loam or a clay loam, that's going to be ideal. It's kind of like a Goldilocks type of soil. If you have 40% sand, 40% silt, 20% clay, or some mixture that's towards the middle of the soil texture chart, you have a nice Goldilocks level of like enough permeability that the soil is going to be allowing some water through, but it's not so permeable that the water just gushes through the bottom of the soil and it's out and into the water table below where the roots can't reach it. So really good question. You need an in-between level of pore space and permeability. Um, You should know how to use a soil texture chart. The basic tip here is start at the bottom with sand, follow a straight line up, until you get to the point where sand and silt meet, they intersect, and then go straight over to clay. And there's two ways you can check to be sure that you've used it right. You can see if it adds up to 100%. Obviously, it can't add up to you know 80% or 150. <laughs> and you can see, does it make a peace sign? What I mean by a peace sign is like, you know, does it have equal angles on all sides of the line that you're drawing out from your point. So hopefully that helps. You will be given a soil texture chart. They would never say like, you know, what's 60% clay, 20% silt and 20% sand, like off the top. They, they give you the chart. Um, let's go into a few chemical tests you can do on soil. Uh, because that's really important to understand. You can measure its texture. It's going to tell you how permeable or how porous the soil is, how easily water drains. You could test its pH. If a soil is really acidic, really low pH, 
the nutrients are going to be leached out and that's going to make it hard for plants to grow. If it's really basic, it has a really high pH. Oftentimes that's going to buffer any maybe acid rain that's coming into the, to the ecosystem. It's going to maintain soil nutrients better. And so pH is, is an important measure as well. And then nutrient level, how much nitrogen and phosphorus is in your soil. You can do that by just measuring ammonia levels in the soil or nitrate levels or phosphate levels. And of course, higher levels, higher nutrient levels means more plant growth. Uh, it's just that simple. It's really critical to have high nutrient levels. So uh, looks like we're kind of welcoming a second wave of viewers. Probably the people who showed up at the time is actually scheduled. So my apologies to people who showed up at eight and are expecting it just to start. We've been going for an hour, uh, but we're going to keep going until we get through unit five. And then I'll answer some questions at the end. I do want to point this out though. Be careful when you look up an AP score calculator because you don't want to use one that's outdated. And I don't say this like cast shade, but the Albert IO score calculator that comes up is not, is not accurate. Um, so let me pull up my link tree, which I think has a score calculator in it um, and share that. Actually, it doesn't look like it's there. I can find my score calculator um, and share that with you guys. Uh, but that's going to be a more accurate one. You don't want to use just a random one that you find online. Because again, there actually is a really inaccurate one. So let me just find it and I'll... Uh, Pop it in here. It's score calculator. And then I'll, I'll put this sharing on uh, public so you guys can uh, use this. Actually, you know what? Let's look at it together. I think this will be really useful. It's a, it's a good, good kind of um, break from the content as we get into the latter half of four and get ready to go into five. So I'll switch over and show you guys what I'm talking about. And I'll also pop it into the chat um, so we can take a look at it. So here's the score calculator. And let's pin that in the chat. Oops, don't mean to do that. So if you want this exam score calculator that I'm going to run through really quickly, let's take a look at this here so we can kind of on, be on the same page about what's a good score, what do you need to do? Um, so here's an exam score calculator. And let's plug in some scores so we can see. If you had a, um, let's just say 60 out of 80, it's a pretty good score. It's like, uh, what, three-fourths, so 75%, right? Um, so 60 out of 80, 75%. And then let's say on the FRQs, you go like, you know, um, five, three, five. That puts you at an 81 as a composite score. Uh, and so that's in the four range. Uh, so that's, you know, that's not a bad score. 60% multiple choice you know, five, three, five. So you can, you can afford to have like a bad FRQ. Now, if you can average a five on them, maybe do better on one, worse on another, but if you can average a five and you can get up into like 65 questions, correct. Now you're creeping up towards the five range. Um, you probably need to be more towards 75% or uh, 70 questions. Correct with though, with those FRQ scores to get up towards the five, or if you're still back down in the, you know, 65 range and you have like, you can get one of your FRQs or a few of them up to a six, you can really move up here and get closer to a five. So I just think it's useful for you guys to see kind of what you're shooting for here. And this is what I tell my students. I tell my students, if you want to pass, like if you're just shooting for a three, you might be surprised how low that can go. So if you're down at a five average and you can get like 50 out of 80, you're in, you're in passing range. 
Uh, this calculator is pinned in the chat. So if you go to the chat, this should be the top pin there. I will add it to the link tree also so that you can uh, check it out there. But I don't want to waste too much more time during the stream since we want to get through some more content. So yeah. Oh, 70, yeah. 70 out of 80, it would be, is really high. Yeah. Not many people would do that. Um, so one other final kind of comment before we like go back in, um, another comment from B here, don't worry so much about the 50% fail rate. Let me explain something. Um, Texas and Florida, and maybe a few other states, pay for any student who wants to take the exam to take it, which is a good thing from an access standpoint, like opportunity, let's make exams available to any student, regardless of if they can afford it. But what it also means is you have students who write end game spoilers on their FRQs, or write that they don't do math. Like this is literally something that happens. You can see it in the scoring commentary section of the college boards, like, you know, reader commentary. They'll say like, teachers, please help your students prepare how to do math because they write, I don't do math on their FRQ, like many, many students. So you have a lot of students who fail that aren't taking it seriously. And it kind of brings the art, the average artificially down. So don't, panic too much. Don't panic too much. If you're here and you're working hard, I think you're in good shape. And especially if you write a lot of these practice FRQs. All right. And the final thing we'll do, we'll just pin Sushi's comment here as well. Cause this is really, this is really kind of the core of it. You need to take an AP class seriously. If you don't take it seriously, you're probably not going to pass. It's hard. It's hard to pass an AP exam if you don't take it seriously. Um, and so you need to, you need to take it seriously. You guys are all here. You're serious students. You're putting in a lot of effort. Uh, you're going to be studying a lot between tonight and, and Tuesday morning. And so, yeah, the TLDR is a lot of people take the exam without prepping. <laughs> there we go. So let's move on because talking about exam scores, isn't going to necessarily make yours go up. So let's go back to unit four. Uh, someone asked about the Hadley cell. Let's talk about it. One of the hardest, most technical concepts in apes. So let's unpack the Hadley cell and understand the science behind it. So here's the science behind the, behind the Hadley cell. Warm air, I'm sorry, sunlight hits the equator most directly. And so warm air rises at the equator. As it rises, it cools as it gets further away from Earth's surface. Then some of that water condenses and falls as rain. That's why we have tropical rainforest at the equator. Then that air expands and rises more. Eventually it hits basically the layer between the troposphere and the stratosphere. And it starts to spread out. And then it sinks because now it's cooler. It's actually more dense as it gets cooler and spreads out. Uh, it gets further away from the equator and it's going to sink back down to Earth's surface. And it sinks back down at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, roughly. So what that means is we get really high pressure here. When when an a when you know air descends or is is being forced downward, it is it has high pressure and it, it's going to be cold basically hot, dry air. I'm sorry, that is contradictory. It's going to be hot, dry air descending back down to earth. And then that hot, dry air is going to move back towards the equator because of low pressure. Air moves from high pressure at 30 degrees north and south to low pressure at the equator. And then it repeats the cycle over and over again. So this cycle explains two important things, really three, but we're going to go through two right now. One, it explains why the equator is so rainy because the air is being warmed, so it's rising. And as it rises, that moisture condenses and falls. The second thing it explains is why are there such hot, dry, 
high pressure systems at 30 degrees. High pressure because the air is forcing down. It's it's coming back down. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh man. Not used to lecturing for an hour and a half, you guys. Um, we have a lot shorter classes and we do a lot more labs. So my uh, my vocal cords are not built for these two hour marathon sessions, but let's keep rolling. I might actually refill my water here in a second. Uh, do a little intermission and in before we hit unit five. So let's keep going though and talk about the Coriolis effect. <clears throat> so what ha happens is the equator is spinning faster than 30 degrees north or than the North Pole. The reason is it has to spin faster because it has a longer total journey to make. If you're going to make a full revolution at the equator, it has to spin faster because it has such a greater distance to spin, has such a greater, uh, you know, radius there to, to make it around essentially. But if you go up to 30 degrees and then all the way up to 60, it's a much smaller circle. It's turning. So it's, it's actually spinning more slowly. It's a weird thing to think about. You don't have to totally understand that, but here's what you should understand. Because the equator is spinning faster than 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south, that air is deflected. So if air is moving from 30 degrees north back towards the equator and the earth is spinning this way, the air is actually deflected the opposite way of the spin. It's like if you were to jump off a merry-go-round, you don't jump straight off. Merry-go-round spinning and you jump off and you have forward moment momentum carrying you the direction you were just spinning. So it's not able to travel in a straight path. Fun fact, if Earth had no rotation, just still, the wind, if there was still sun, should go straight north, straight south. But it doesn't. It's the spin that's deflecting the wind the opposite direction. So from 0 to 30, uh, we have what are called the eastern trade winds. They are blowing from east to west. And then from 30 to 60, we have the westerlies moving from west to east. So most of you probably live in the continental U.S. I'm just going to guess that. You might not. Shout out to anybody who's an international student. Let us know in the chat if you're an international student. It's always cool to see people studying from another country. But if you live in North America, um, continental U.S., and you get your weather essentially from the West. Like if you look at a weather map, the weather's always moving from West to East. And that's how you can remember we have westerlies in 30 to 60 degrees because the, most of the continental United States is between 30 and 60 degrees. Uh, Natalia asked a good question. Have you seen um, wind patterns show up on an FRQ? Yes, wind patterns can show up on an FRQ. Um, oh, that's actually not the comment I meant to pin, but shout out to that person. We also have someone from China. That's really cool. It is really neat to see people from other countries studying. Oh yeah, and they have to wake up early too. That is uh, That does add a layer of difficulty here. So yeah, much respect to our international colleagues and peers who are studying. Uh, but Natalia, Natalia asks, have you seen wind patterns show up on an FRQ? Yes, on an FRQ about El Nino and La Nina, which is also a topic that I know a lot of people are afraid of or a lot of people uh, would be nervous to see. So let's cover El Nino and La Nina and talk about how this eastern trade wind is critical to understanding El Nino and La Nina. So we're going to skip past a couple topics. And we're going to wrap up unit nine with what I think is the toughest topic, which is El Nino and La Nina. A little bit further. Oh, oh boy. Oh boy. All right. Let's slow down a second here. <laughs> Our slides are going crazy. All right. So I said that wind patterns are really important to understand El Nino and La Nina. 
Now we have another question in the chat. Um, do you need to memorize zero to 30 and 30 to 60? Kind of, yeah. Like it, it is kind of important that you know from zero to 30, as I have shown on this map, trade winds are going east to west. That is important. You do have to know that. And then from 30 to 60, trade winds are going west to east. And that is important too. <clears throat> so let's talk about why this matters. One, it explains why you have gyres that are rotating, basically rotating big bodies of water. And they explain the direction that ocean basins or that gyres rotate. So clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere, counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. That's because if we look at the Northern Hemisphere, right along the equator, uh, if we look at the North Atlantic gyre here, you're going to have this air being blown east to west right along the equator. It's going to run into the Gulf of Mexico. It's going to start moving north. Then when it gets to 30 degrees, it switches directions and it gets blown west to east. And so that's going to lead to a clockwise rotation. Opposite is true in the southern hemisphere. And so that's why it's counterclockwise. You have air, you have water traveling, you know, along the equator and then getting directed back and then getting directed, you know, west to east instead when it goes dips below 30 degrees. And that's going to lead to counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to memorize that. I wouldn't be really concerned about that or, or hurricanes. They're not usually a huge focus. Let's stay focused on El Nino and La Nina, which are likely to come up on the exam in some way, shape, or form. But to address the question, Franco, um, it's kind of complicated. Hurricanes actually spin the opposite direction of the gyre. They spin and, and their, their spin is deflect. It's also related to the Coriolis effect. Their spin is going to look the opposite based on the rotation of earth beneath them. I don't want to spend a lot of time on hurricane spin direction is just not on the exam. Cool topic but not something to, to focus on. So let's stay focused on El Nino and La Nina. And let's look at something called upwelling. So upwelling is a really important thing to understand. Well, let's go back though. Because what happens is in this yellow circle that I have, the surface water is being blown from east to west. And that brings up cold surface water from beneath to replace the warm surface water. That upwelling brings oxygen because cold water has more oxygen. It brings up nutrients and it uses uh, and it leads to more, you know, diverse fish ecosystems, more diverse open ocean, and that leads to more productive fisheries. So that's going to be really helpful to know when it comes to El Nino and La Nina. I'll explain why in a second. First of all, let's review what it is. So ENSO, as it's called, is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. That's because in any given year, we're going back and forth between an El Nino year, a La Nina year, or a normal year, which has an ENSO level that is not out of this standard range. And so what we want to do, though, is understand the conditions behind that. This is the, <clears throat> I don't know, you know, million dollar or $50 slide or whatever you want to call it in unit nine, like or in unit four, it's, it's topic 4.9. This is one of the hardest topics to understand, but this slide is going to really break that down and simplify it for you guys. So in a normal year, wind is going from east to west and we have really strong upwelling. We have the thermocline, which is this balance between the warm surface water and the colder, deeper water. And that's what we see here on this far left diagram. We have a thermocline that's allowing a lot of cold water up to the surface to replace that warm water that's getting blown away from South America. That's why the wind direction matters. It blows that water, that warm surface water away from South America. And that brings up the cold water from beneath to replace it. And that is going to be really critical for fisheries there. It's also going to lead to cooler and drier temperatures in the Americas when compared to Southeast Asia and Australia. So you're going to have warm surface water shifting over towards Australia, Southeast Asia. You're going to have a lot of evaporation because it's warmer. You're going to have a lot of rainfall because that warm air is holding a lot of moisture. And then that is going to lead to 
this kind of rainy weather that we see in Southeast Asia and Australia. Now we get into an El Nino year. And the one thing that separates El Nino from La Nina and from a normal year is the Eastern trade winds. It's why I bolded this here. The trade winds, the Eastern trade winds get weaker and they actually even reverse course potentially. In some areas, you have a little bit of a reversal where it's almost more west to east or they're just really weakened. What that does is it leads to this pooling up of warm water. So if you've ever been in a pool in the summer, and there's no wind blowing, that top layer of the pool gets really warm because the sun's hitting it, it can warm it up, but the deeper layer is colder. In an El Nino year, it's like that wind blowing the warm water away from South America, it sort of stopped. Uh, and it's not stopped, it's not as if there's no wind, but it's weakened. So you get a lot of warm water building up and this actually leads to globally warmer temperatures total. Yes, and here is another great point here. You have to keep in mind that El Nino is going to have a consequence for the fishing industries. This is a uh, an aspect of El Nino and La Nina that comes up often, comes up frequently. So this is something that you should watch out for. They might talk about anchovy catch. They might talk about fishing profits. Uh, and what causes it to happen is a really complex atmospheric uh, physics issue <laughs> where the walker circulation changes. You don't need to know it for the apes exam, but Google walker circulation, if you're curious, it, it is pretty cool. But basically those trade winds weaken. That's what you need to know from an apes standpoint. It produces this warm effect in the eastern tropical Pacific that we're talking about here near the Americas. It rains a lot harder because of that. And it's going to be warmer globally because of all that warm water building up. Now we go over to La Nina. In La Nina, we have super strong easterlies. So it's the normal conditions, but it's super strong. So we're blowing all that warm water over towards Australia and Southeast Asia. They unfortunately may experience flash flooding or extremely heavy rainfall. Their typhoons may be stronger. It may be a more um, extreme weather event that they have there. Their natural storms that are occurring due to local weather are just stronger. They have more total heat, more energy. They rain harder, faster winds. In the Americas, on the other hand, especially South America, we're going to see colder, drier weather. You may see drought. Um, you may see a little milder winter because of this. And then you're going to see this really dramatic upwelling. So if you're a fisherman in Chile or you know Peru and it's a La Nina year, it's kind of like a bumper crop. You get extra cold water, extra upwelling of nutrients, really productive fisheries, and you're probably going to do better than in an El Nino year and even in a normal year. All right, everybody. We're coming down the home stretch, which is good because I'm running out of steam here. Uh, like I said, 90-minute uh, lectures are not something that I do. <laughs> Kyra can attest to this. Kyra was an ape scholar. Um, even in a hybrid year, we did a lot of we did a lot of experiments, a lot of you know hands-on case studies, things like that. So I didn't, I didn't do a lot of 90 minute lecturing. I don't know if I've ever done that. So I am, I'm running out of steam here, but we got one more unit to get through and then we are going to call it a night and give you guys some time to study. And what I want to do is focus on clear cutting first, super important issue. And then we're going to get into some of the agricultural concepts here. But we're going to actually take a brief intermission. I'm not going to turn off the stream or anything, but I'm out of water. So I'm going to fill up my water. Um, we'll just leave you here with the eights versus everybody background there. <laughs> uh, and maybe take a second to stretch your legs. Get yourself a drink of water. But I'm going to get a drink of water. We're going to finish strong with unit five. Uh, and I'll answer a few questions at the end. I'll turn off the slides and we'll just do like Q&A for the last 10 to 15 minutes. And yeah, Armando's running out of steam too. 
Um, and so get yourself a little water and then uh, we'll be back to finish off unit five and answer a couple questions, but I'll be right back. All righty, you guys ready? Unit five. Unit five is a doozy, 17 topics. Uh, and if you had to sum up unit five, I would say, uh, <laughs> I would say that unit five is environmental problems from land use and then environmental solutions. But yeah, I had to get some water to see what my water holding capacity is. We'll see if if I'm really porous, maybe I'm really sandy, like a sandy soil and the water goes right through, or if I can be more like a clay dominated soil and really hold on to uh, hold on to that water. All right, unit five. This is a big, big critical topic and slide here. 5.2, clear cutting. So Basic level apes understanding is, you know, deforestation, bad, clear cutting, not good, but we have to ask ourselves why, why is it not good? One reason is you're going to lose a lot of the soil, which we know is critically important for plant growth. It's a habitat for microorganisms. It holds nutrients plants need. It filters water. You lose that soil. It gets eroded down your stream banks or down your hills or your mountains when you don't have any trees there to physically hold it in place with its roots, anchoring it, but also just to physically stop the force of the water falling with, with the leaves and trunk and everything. Uh, and then you have also heating of the water. So the water is going to heat because you have all of this sediment going in. So it's going to get darker. It's going to be brown and have a lower albedo and really absorb sunlight. And, and hold on to it. But then also you lose the shade. So you don't have the shade hanging over the stream that's blocking the sunlight and that's keeping it cooler. So that's going to be an issue. You can always have uh, landslides as well because that land basically just falls into, into the water. It gets washed away. So let's talk about benefits of trees. And my slides got a little off here. But another thing that people know at a basic level is, okay, um, trees can filter air, but how do they do that? Well, their leaves can actually physically trap dust particles, particulate matter. And in some cases, their pores, their stomata can physically take in nitrogen oxides or vox or even sulfur dioxide and like hang on to it and keep it from being in the atmosphere. So it's a huge benefit. Of course, they're a habitat too. That's a really important thing. Uh, and so we sort of talked about how do they filter the air? They trap those pollutants, specifically particulate matter, 
or knocks or they pull it into their, you know, leaf tissues. They can be a habitat for organisms so they can preserve biodiversity. But don't forget that trees are basically giant CO2 sequestering machines. Sequester is a fancy word for store. So CO2 stores get stored up in trees. They pull it out of the atmosphere and they fix it into their wood or their roots or their other tissues, their bark or leaves. And we have less climate change. So many benefits of trees. Uh, if we go on to the green revolution, the green revolution is going to bring in a bunch of agricultural techniques that are really productive. We produce tons of food and we feed a lot more people, but we cause some soil erosion, nutrient loss of soil and biodiversity loss in the process. So mechanization it's great that we have these big combines to harvest tons and tons, literal tons of, of crops at a time. It's cheaper for consumers, more total food, but it's going to kick up a lot of dust. It's going to cause a lot of erosion. And it's going to also lead us to emitting some greenhouse gases because so much of our mechanization process has been powered by fossil fuels. We've got high yield varieties. We should know these are a little bit different than GMOs. These are species that have been crossed with each other intentionally to get really productive wheat plants that produce big, tall stalks with tons of grains of wheat on them, big corn, you know, cobs with huge kernels. And so they're sort of like pre GMOs. They're like what we did before we actually did GMO, you know, gene insertion with CRISPR and other things like that. Uh, so don't forget about that. Then we get into actual GMOs. So these are similar, except for we're going to actually take a gene that was never in corn, like the BT gene. And that BT gene is going to make the corn resistant to pests. So in this picture, we have corn on the bottom that does not have the BT gene and insects are eating it. On the top, we have a corn cob that does not have the, or that does have the BT gene genetically added to its genome. Now, when corn insects, corn eating insects go to bite it, they actually die and they're not able to eat the corn because they are poisoned by this protein that the BT corn is able to make. So GMOs are going to make you larger plants, usually that give you more profit, more yield per acre, more total corn in the same amount of space, and maybe could save you money on pesticides because you don't have to spray your crops if they have their own genetic pest resistance programmed in. Then we have synthetic fertilizer. It's going to really increase production per acre or yield, as we call it in agriculture. Yield just means production, how much you get. But it can run off from agricultural fields and cause eutrophication. It also requires fossil fuel production to create. So you can get um, CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. You can also get this algae bloom or this eutrophied, I shouldn't say eutrophied, um, in, uh, enriched with nutrients, water that's undergone eutrophication. And it's going to have this, this algae bloom, you know, block sunlight, the algae die, bacteria break them down, you lose oxygen in the water. And so you have all of these, all of these issues here that go with synthetic fertilizer. Irrigation has been beneficial because we can grow crops in more areas. We can grow crops with more security and produce greater yields, but you could overdraw from groundwater sources, especially aquifers that recharge slowly. Uh, and so that's an issue there. It's not always the most sustainable. All right, let's skip ahead a little bit into tilling. Um, we'll touch on monocropping first. So monocropping, uh, just means planting one species as far as the eye can see and then harvesting them all at the same time. The problem is this leaves the soil bare for huge stretches, sometimes, you know, miles or many, many, many acres. And that's going to lead to more soil erosion. It's also going to decrease habitat and it's going to decrease biodiversity, meaning you're a little bit more prone to disease. You don't have genetic diversity. You don't have crop diversity, but it's highly efficient. So you can just apply all the same fertilizer, 
all the same pesticides. You can water it all the same, but again, it comes with those drawbacks. Let's talk about tilling. Tilling is interesting. Farmers till because it makes it a lot easier to work the soil. It's easier to plant seeds in it. It's easier for those seeds to spread out their roots and grow into a plant. It also can help get rid of weeds. And so tilling often gets a bad rap, but there's a lot of reasons to till. What are the problems with it though? And why should a farmer consider no till? The problem is it looses up the soil. It's the physical chopping or breaking up of soil. Um, you use a machine though. You're not going to karate chop it. That wouldn't be very useful. So you use a big tiller or a plow in the olden days that pulled by a horse and it mixes the soil. The problem is that kicks it up in the air. So some of it is lost as dust, but it's also really loose. And so it gets washed away, blown away by the wind or the water really easily. And you lose organic matter. You lose nutrients that get eroded with that process of, of um, erosion, wind and rain. This is an issue because over time, you actually get a hardening of your soil. Your soil will get really hard and cakey and kind of crusty because you're constantly tilling it and you're constantly just building up and compressing these layers of soil instead of leaving the crop residue, which can break down and add nutrients back to the soil, but also just anchor the soil, like hold it down. Um, nutrients are going to be retained by that. They're going to be even added back to the soil maybe. So no till is a really critical way to preserve soil health. All right, let's move on a little bit further. Let's touch on the five, uh, four types of irrigation quickly. These are ways you can water your plants to increase their growth, increase your profits if you're a farmer. Um, you can do furrow, which digs these long trenches and then just fills them up with water. You can just flood your crops. You can use spray irrigation, which is this big machine that goes out and sprays with sprinklers. It's a really you know fun dance move you can do at prom if you want to impress people with your apes knowledge. And then there's drip irrigation, which is going to be a long hose that's going to be kind of snaked out between your crops and it's just going to drip little drop by drop into the soil. The reason you might want to use drip irrigation or spray irrigation is it's highly efficient. It's going to deliver more water right to your soil and to your crops. It's going to waste less. When you flood your field or when you dig trenches and do furrow irrigation, you lose a lot of water to evaporation or runoff. But when you drip it and just deliver it right to your crops, you lose very little to evaporation. You lose very little to runoff. So a great FRQ question might be what's a good way to conserve water in a dry climate? Drip irrigation would be a great way to do that. So would spray. All right. Drawbacks, they are expensive. They do take energy. It's a lot easier to just flood your field. But you're going to lose some to runoff and you're going to potentially drown your plants if you flood them. So another advantage of drip irrigation. Government should subsidize it. Yeah. That would be nice if it would be cheaper for farmers to do drip irrigation. It would definitely help conserve water and soil. Second best is spray irrigation in terms of efficiency. Uh, let's move on though. And let's talk about pesticides. So with pesticides, the goal is to kill pests that eat your plants, of course. And the problem with them though, is that pests get resistant. So think back to, you know, unit two, where we talked about biodiversity and then unit two point topic 2.6, we talked about adaptation. Unfortunately, if you use the same pesticide over and over again, your pests get resistant. The ones that have a genetic mutation or adaptation that lets them survive the pesticide they survive, they reproduce, and they pass that genetic resistance onto their offspring. Now the whole population is resistant to that pesticide. And so what happens is you need to make a new pesticide. And so 
a solution. I love to see a person here in the chat. Uh, can pests get resistance to IPM? And I love it. You guys are just jumping right ahead to the solution. This is great. So let's let's skip right to IPM. I love it. IPM or integrated pest management is going to be um, actually not in this slideshow for some reason. <laughs> I just went to the last slide and this must be unit five, part one. So let's pump the brakes on IPM because I have to load up another slide deck for that. It won't take long, but I'm, I'll load that in. In the meantime, let's just review how genetic modification can decrease the amount of pesticides you use or actually increase. It's kind of tricky. So read through this for a second. See if you can wrap your head around how GMOs could actually increase on one hand or decrease on the other hand. I will get these uh, five part two slides queued up so we can check those out and look at IPM because IPM is a really important solution to this. All right, um, Google Drive not cooperating quite yet. So let's keep rolling and we'll try to pull in IPM here in a second. Basic idea of IPM is instead of putting so many pesticides on your field, you use a combination of methods. So you might use a natural predator. You bring in ladybugs to eat aphids or birds that are gonna eat caterpillars that eat your crops. Or you could do crop rotation. Crop rotation is a really helpful way to do this. Um, that's a really great, again, way to, to basically trick your pests. Because what happens is your pests lay eggs in the soil. They hatch the next year. And they're ready to eat corn or whatever crop was there the year before. But when you rotate your crops, all of a sudden, all of your corn pests hatch. And it's soybeans in the field. And they're not evolved to eat soybeans in a lot of cases. So you've almost like tricked them in addition to giving your soil a chance to recover from, from one kind of nitrogen demanding crop like corn by replacing it with a nitrogen fixing crop like peas or beans. Um, so we'll try to take a look there in a second. GMOs, though, like I said, you can decrease your pesticide use if you give the GMO a gene for resistance like the BT corn, or you could accidentally increase the use of GMOs. I shouldn't say accidentally, but like you can use Roundup ready soybeans where the soybean is tolerant to Roundup, this broad spectrum herbicide. And then you just douse the field with Roundup and the soybeans can tolerate it, but it kills all the other weeds and it leads to increased pesticide use. So it's double-edged sword. Uh, again, why does it matter that you have genetic diversity in your field? Well, if you have no genetic diversity, if every single plant is this cloned, uh, where'd our potatoes go? There we go. If every single plant is this cloned GMO and it is susceptible to a disease because they're not perfect. GMOs don't resist every disease under the sun. Then you're going to have this catastrophic crop loss, where if the potato is susceptible to blight, this disease that makes it turn black instead of, you know, a normal russet color, that's going to kill the whole crop. Like you just lost all of your, your potatoes. And that's why genetic diversity is important. So call back to unit two earlier. Uh, now let's talk about meat production. 
So a CAFO is a concentrated animal feeding operation. And the problem with a CAFO is that it's going to result in antibiotic and growth hormone use. It's going to result in a ton of manure. That manure can leach into groundwater or run off into surface water and transfer E. coli or phosphorus or nitrogen or bacteria into the water. And you're going to release a ton of methane. So cows belch and fart methane, and that leads to climate change. Why do we use CAFOs? Highly efficient. You're going to cram lots of animals into a small area. You're going to get a ton of value out of that area. And you're going to drive the cost of meat down. So for the consumer, you can buy a $2 hamburger or even a $5 hamburger when a free range hamburger would cost a lot more money. You just need more land, takes more time. You can't produce as many cattle. So that's important to understand. Again, manure lagoons, these big pits that build up, lots of animal waste. But then if it rains really hard, they can flood and flow into nearby waters. They can leach into groundwater. And that's going to be problematic for any species that lives there or any human that drinks from that body of water. So manure lagoons, in addition to contaminating water if they overflow, are also going to release nitrous oxide, N2O. Not to be confused with NOx, NOx is NO2, but nitrous oxide that comes off of the manure lagoon contributes to climate change. All right, so let's go through and talk about a few more ways we can do this. So you could do free range grazing instead of CAFOs. You could have your cattle spread out. They're not going to have the manure lagoons build up. They're not going to uh, damage surrounding waters with their waste overflow potentially. You're not going to have to use hormones or antibiotics on them. But they're going to take way more time because they're going to grow up their natural life cycle without growth hormones. They're going to eat grass, which they're evolved to do. So they're going to grow more slowly than if they eat corn. Um, and so those are some of the drawbacks. It's going to cost a lot more money if you're a consumer and you want a free range burger. But they can actually graze in areas that would be too, gr too dry for other crops. And so they could actually produce food in an area that's otherwise too dry. That's a big bad. If we look at a drawback though, of free range overgrazing. So the animals can overgraze on an area and actually cause it to become um, a desert. And that comes from their hooves compacting the soil or chewing the soil down to basically the nub or the root. And that plant actually dies. And now we have soil erosion and we can't support plant growth there anymore. And so cattle can permanently damage an area, not to mention the endocrine disruptors that the chat is talking about right now when it comes to the hormones. So the hormones that come in CAFO meat can sometimes be contained in the meat, but can also flow into the water sources in their waste that can lead to gender imbalances in fish or amphibians or species that live in the water. And that's going to jump ahead to, to unit eight. All right. We are going to wrap it up with the inefficiency of meat. And then I'm going to take questions. And then we're going to actually cut the second half of unit five. We're going to push it to tomorrow night because we're rolling on two hours. And you guys need to do a little your own review. I need to get to bed. So I have something left in the tank for tomorrow night. And Monday night, actually, there's a ultimate review packet review Monday night. Um, and my own students, we have, we have school Monday. So I need to, I need to get some sleep here soon, but let's wrap up with the inefficiency of meat so we can understand the why behind it. And then I'll answer some questions. So why is it inefficient to produce meat for human consumption? You have to produce all of the plant food for the animal, and then also feed and house the animal itself. So to create beef, you have to grow all of this corn that takes up all the space to grow the corn and feed to the cow. Remember the 10% rule from trophic pyramids says that 10% of the biomass from corn will make it to a cow. 
So if a cow eats, let's just say, you know, 10 kilograms of corn, you probably had to actually have 100 kilograms of corn biomass space for that 10 kilograms of cow corn that it eats. That's a huge amount of space when you think about how much corn a cow eats. All the water the cow drinks itself, but all the water to grow the corn, and then all the fertilizer input to grow all that corn for the cow. Not to mention the antibiotics. And so you just can't produce meat, nearly as much meat, I should say, with the same area of land as you can produce plants. So if you took one acre of land and you just, or hectare, and you just grew soy on it, you'd get more total protein, more total usable food for humans out of that soy field than if you grew that soy and fed the equivalent amount of soy to a cow. And that's the big key is you have to clarify that it's per unit of area, you can't produce as much beef. And it's tricky because you look at a CAFO and you're like, look at that tiny area with all those cows. Aren't we producing a lot of energy, you know, a lot of protein per acre? No, we had to have huge amounts of fields to grow corn to feed to those cows. Whereas we could just eat the corn ourselves or the soy ourselves, And that's going to dramatically decrease the total area of land required to produce that equivalent amount of protein. So we're going to wrap up. We're halfway through unit five. We're going to pick up tomorrow. And tomorrow, what we're going to cover is going to be unit second half of unit five through unit nine. So I want to leave uh, some space here for a couple questions. Um, so we'll just see if there are questions that we have that we can answer quickly, point people in the right direction uh, for the studying that they're going to do tonight, tomorrow, Monday, and then make sure to check back with the channel. Tomorrow's live stream is going to be seven to eight though. Um, it's going to be a school night. So I have school Monday, obviously, like, like you guys do. And I usually go to bed by like 8.30 or 9. And so I don't really want to be up until um, nine on a, on a school night on a live stream. So we'll go seven to eight tomorrow, you know, seven to maybe like eight twenty, eight thirty. but we're going to uh, cut it off there. And then Monday there'll be a live stream as well. So just stay tuned to Instagram, TikTok, or the YouTube channel, and, and you'll see the details for that. All right. So let's just look at a couple questions. Um, you can definitely write on the packet during the test and, and you should, so you can work things out there. Um, let's take a look here. This is a great, great question, but the chat is moving too fast. So let's take a look at this question for an identify a human effect other than death. This is a trend that the college board is doing now. You guys, they're asking you what to stop bumping my table here. They're asking you identify a consequence for humans or for non-target species of a pesticide or something other than death, endocrine disruption. So a disruption of the nervous system could be a big non-lethal effect that you could talk about. You could talk about nervous system damage. If you're talking about a, a plant or an animal species, um, you could talk about a population decline or forced migration because their preferred food source isn't there. So be prepared to name some non-lethal effects. Again, disruption of endocrine system, um, cancer genetic mutation. You could talk about, again, uh, forced migration if you're a population or you know confusion or headache if you're talking about like noise pollution or air pollution. So be prepared for sub-lethal effects, not just death. All right. Yeah, population decline is kind of death. You would want to pair population decline with like then a resulting loss of food for like a higher trophic pyramid species. I've seen that on an answer key before. Um, and so that that could be something you could still talk about. Um, another good question here. What's the best way to study for FRQs? I know look at past FRQs, but anything else with all three questions about the FRQs and what's the difference between identify, describe, explain? I'm so glad you asked because we need to take a second to look at the task verb sheet. So let's switch back over to our screen share here. 
And I want to go to the ultimate review packet for a second. Everybody can check out the ultimate review packet unit one totally for free. It doesn't cost anything. Yeah, um, you just log in and you can check out unit one and you can see, does this seem like a resource that I want to use? And so if we go to the welcome here and we look at the FRQ task verb sheet, this is in the ultimate review packet. So you can go to the ultimate review packet. It's in the description for all my videos or you just Google apes ultimate review packet. And what you're going to find is this FRQ task verb sheet that we're about to see. This is going to break down exactly, exactly how you want to answer different questions. And so if you want to answer a described, um, you are going to want two layers of detail, basic key details. So one, one layer of detail and then support it with something still connected to the question, still connected to the prompt. Here's the number one mistake I see on describe prompts. Students will give two answers instead of one, but they won't support that either of the two answers with supporting details. So you have to prop your answer up with supporting details. Let's look at a scoring guide for an example of this. I think this is really helpful if we go back to these um, free response questions here, but we're going to look at the scoring guide. So I think, again, understanding how to write smarter, not harder is really, really key. So if we go to the scoring guidelines, again, spoiler alert, if you are like, I'm going to write all of FRQ set number one, um, tell you what, we just, we won't spoil more answers for FRQ set number one. We'll just go back and just grab a 2019 question. That should make it a little easier. That way we don't spoil answers. But we'll take a look here and I'll show you what I mean by these different layers of detail. So if we go down and we want to try to find a describe question or an explain question. These are almost all explain. Um, so let's look and explain. Explain why certain organisms such as calcium carbonate shells are threatened by decreasing pH levels. That's not a good question, though, because they're not going to do an explain that's two points like this on this year's exam. This is kind of an outdated format. And they're not going to ask you to determine or predict either. They would just say identify. So let's actually go back and just try to find a different question to look at. All right, here's a great example. Describe how a primary air pollutant becomes part of the atmosphere. So primary air pollutants are released directly from a specific source. There's kind of your first layer of detail, such as, and then you give an example, smokestack, tailpipe, etc. Um, and so there's kind of your two layers of detail. Let's go to another example of a describe, see if we can sign one here. Uh, describe how a secondary air pollutant is formed within the atmosphere. So you have secondary air pollutants are formed when primary air pollutants, that would be kind of your first layer of detail, is it's they come from primary, but when they react with other compounds. So there's kind of your two layers of detail. They come from primary pollutants when that primary pollutant reacts with another compound. You could also just give an example. That works as well. Discuss is not a, a task verb you'll see. So if you go back here, you may notice like, hey, there's no discuss on your sheet. It's because this year it'll be describe. It'll be explained. It'll be one of these seven task verbs. <clears throat> so that's an important point. If you're reviewing past FRQs, you need to make sure that you know that you won't see those outdated task verbs um, on on this year's exam. So again, good question here. How can you study for FRQs? Make sure that you have the task verb, which you can get in the ultimate review packet, or you can find it on my link tree and that you know how to tailor your answer to the prompt that they're asking about. I'll also try to put in more practice FRQs in tomorrow's live stream uh, so that we can stop and kind of review some of those. All right. 
I think we have time for one more question after this great question here. What should I eat in between multiple choice and FRQ? This is actually an important question. I wouldn't eat something really sugary or with a lot of simple carbohydrates. So I know your school might actually give you, you know, like candy or like, you know, candy bars or stuff like that, or, or um, trail mix or stuff. Well, trail mix would actually be a little better, but like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Granola bars. I might go for some more complex carbohydrates. So like, you know, uh, some whole wheat bread, bring in a whole wheat sandwich with peanut butter, uh, bring in some nuts. Nuts are really filling and they have slow kind of, they're going to give you a lot of protein, which is going to make you feel full. They're not going to lead to a big blood sugar spike though. So there you go. Something that doesn't have a ton of sugar. All right. Um, or you can go the route Kyra took and just fruit snacks, just give yourself a blitz of glucose and trust that it will carry you through those last 70 minutes. I think the key is you only have to make it through 70 minutes, the FRQ. So maybe you do go with something with a little more sugar. Um, Brody says, I'm cooking burgers between the two parts. That's going to have to be a fast burger to cook. I don't know if you can quite make it. Apple with peanut butter. I give that a thumbs up. That's This is an apes approved snack here. Definitely. All right. I think this is it for units one through five review, you guys. It's been a lot of fun. Here we are two hours and 15 minutes later. <laughs> on what was supposed to be a one hour review, but it's been a lot of fun. I think you guys have hopefully learned a lot. You've asked some great questions. You've answered each other's questions, which is so much fun. Um, it's really cool to see that. Kyra has been here faithfully moderating, answering so many questions, directing people to links. So give her some, some poetry snaps wherever you are studying from. And say thank you to Kyra in the chat for being a great moderator and helping answer questions, direct people towards links. Lots of fun to have someone that knows their ape stuff, you know, pointing you guys in the right direction. If you've been here for the whole two hours and 20 minutes, wow, give yourself a, a pat on the back. Give yourself a round of applause, some poetry snaps. It's been a lot of fun. You've learned a ton and you're probably ready for bed or for a break at this point. I know I am. So thank you guys so much for showing up. If you're watching this on a replay and you're not here live, check out the other replay for part six through nine, which will be tomorrow night, seven to eight. And as always, you guys know how we wrap things up. Uh, think like a mountain and write like a scholar. Best of luck in your last minute studying. We'll see you in tomorrow's live stream or in subsequent future videos. Have a good night, everybody.